Hi everybody, welcome to the webinar for growing cross-border sales and fulfillment with uh, Winculum in partnership with One World. And uh, we have uh, uh, an eminent panel here today. Uh, just a quick introduction about myself. Uh, I am one of the founders of Winculum. Winculum is a global software company enabling the e-commerce ecosystem. So we work with uh, sellers, brands, and retailers to help them uh, grow on multiple channels and uh, grow both domestically and internationally. Uh, we, I mean, I'll just go straight to the other panelists. Uh, Mike, Mike is uh, Mike Gosumi is the research director from IDC, and uh, he is responsible for research, uh, development, production, and growth for IDC in retail and hospitality industries. And as a part of what he does, uh, he uh, focuses on omnichannel strategy, customer engagement, mobility solutions, and looks at both process and technology in terms of helping uh, companies to uh, go global and uh, you, uh, look at all the methods in which you can uh, use digital and mobility to grow your business. Uh, we also have Atul uh, Bhakta. Atul is uh, the managing director and founder of uh, One World. And Atul uh, has created a, a very strong cross border shipping company uh, based out of UK with uh, office, with uh, Sodation and uh, Fulfillment Center based out of Birmingham. And uh, One World is one of the leaders enabling. Uh, cross-border sales in the European markets. So without much ado, I'll jump in and uh, we'll be today talking about the growth opportunities in cross-border retailing. Uh, when we look at the uh, space right, uh, we see that cross-border sales is expected to do $4 trillion in 2020. We're really talking about 15% of uh, retailing is expected to, uh, to be through cross-border. Uh, we look at uh, China. China is one of the market leaders who has tapped into this opportunity already. Uh, they've gone through a cycle of the last decade to perfect the process. Uh, there is an opportunity here for the rest of the globe. Uh, Southeast Asia is uh, clearly uh, a geographical market uh, with a very vibrant e-commerce industry. And uh, we're looking at a possibly a five times growth. Um, in, uh, well, the, the article here is talking about 2013 to 2018, but uh, I think really we're looking at exponential growth uh, in terms of the potential opportunity. So I'll, I'll uh, uh, I mean, this is, these are some numbers here. We'll uh, start off by asking the experts here. Mike, uh, uh, if, uh, if you look at uh, cross-border as a space, and if we uh, look at a scenario where all brands are being facilitated to grow uh, globally, uh, what do you think the numbers potentially could be? We could start more positively with that. What is the real market opportunity that we're talking about? Thank you, Venkat. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Gassamy. Uh, well, in terms of the opportunities, uh, I would say that uh, we need to look at you know the the, the whole concept of the cross border, and uh, looking at the cross border, it opens you know uh, potential uh, new revenue streams for brands for retailers in uh, globally, and of course uh, it brings you know a, a new level of customer expectation as well. So uh, if you look at you know the current uh, you know the the. The, the sales revenue of the cross border, we are expecting to see about uh, almost a tri one trillion by 2020, which is uh, quite a sizable amount uh, for one specific sector. And in terms of the opportunity, it's not just about uh, selling internationally, but at the same time, uh, getting exposure and having a customer base in other territories and uh, in other geographic locations. Which, uh, although it might seem that you know uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, uh, huge, it's uh, growing, but at the same time, it, it it has its own set of challenges, which we will talk about in later. 
Thank you, Mike. Uh, and uh, well, uh, I will again ask you a related question that uh, in, in Singapore and Malaysia, we see that 55% uh, already is, there's a lot of cross-border sales happening. Now, what do you think about uh, the potential there and what do you see happening in Southeast Asia particularly? Okay, uh, given the Southeast Asia uh, growing e-commerce market and in, in certain countries like in, in Indonesia, we see that uh, is almost about 30% uh, annually. So of course, uh, cross-border would bring you know the added you know uh, uh, driving force for the for the e-commerce business in, 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 in total, which means that you know although the the retailers would be able to actually to uh, sell in other countries, but they start growing at a rate of almost about 25% uh, annually, which is almost you know twice the uh, the domestic e-commerce uh, retail sales, which means you know it's it's it brings you know the added uh, sales revenue for retail brands uh, in the region, but of course at, at the same time uh, the retailers the brands they can offer uh, you know their products their solutions to the international customers and I, as I said earlier uh, it helps them to boost. Uh, their offerings, and at the same time, uh, expanding you know their reach to the to the new regions, to the new territories. Okay, thank you for that. Let's uh, jump into uh, some of the most popular categories. So, as we see, uh, some of the popular categories are fashion, uh, home furnishing, health and beauty products. So, uh, and electronics, when, uh, these are some of the very popular categories. I'll uh, jump in and ask uh, Atul his view on what's happening in Europe. Are these the same categories that you see, Atul, in terms of what are popular in uh, Europe, in terms of the categories of uh, which, which customers are purchasing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, from a European perspective, Apparel is right, right on top. I mean, Apparel is, is leading the way. Um, it overtook electronics about three years back. Electronics used to be uh, on the number one spot, but yes, apparels, shoes, fashion has, has now taken the number one spot across Europe. Okay, I'll tell you, voice is coming a little uh, uh, slow. You might have to speak louder or increase the speaker. Okay, so um, apparels is definitely the number one position in Europe. Uh, the categories that we are showing here includes entertainment, electronics, footwear. These are these are big categories. Health supplements as well. So um, pretty much mirrors what you're showing on the slide. Um, and yes, uh, definitely fashion and apparels are right on top. Okay, and, and Mike, in terms of Asia, yeah, would this still hold true in your view? Mike? Yes, I, I was explaining that as far as the Southeast Asia is concerned, uh, what we see in terms of the products uh, are healthcare, cosmetics, uh, pet care, and uh, sporting goods. So these are the products that are uh, growing in terms of the cross-border sales. But of course, traditionally, uh, fashion and electronics, as Atul mentioned correctly, is always uh, the, the top selling items for Asia Pacific. Okay, now so uh, pretty much when we look at it, uh, uh, fashion and electronics are the early uh, opportunity sectors and clearly the uh, prosper in e-commerce itself Fashion is very big in e-commerce, so logically cross-border sales also has seen a big uh, push from the fashion uh, you know, sector. But I think as things progress along, pretty much uh, every product out there with, where there is a clear opportunity to, uh, from a cost versus sales perspective, it's really about finding those niche opportunities. Uh, every sector would see a growth in cross-border sales. So there's a wide variety that we are seeing. 
and uh, we're already seeing uh, many markets globally which are uh, seeing significant growth. So let's uh, jump into the next uh, thing in terms of what uh, uh, I've been focused on sellers and brands. So when we look at brands, right, when today uh, we, we are seeing a lot of brands experimenting in terms of trying to sell on marketplaces. Uh, so from our experience, we are seeing the brands in India, brands in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, and, even, and retailers uh, are very clearly uh, looking at uh, trying out selling on marketplaces domestically as an extra channel. And uh, they're also uh, experimenting and trying to sell into cross-border marketplaces. So what's your view, uh, Mike, in terms of marketplaces as a channel? Is there a, uh, is it a clear uh, green signal in terms of saying that everybody should look at marketplaces as a channel? Uh, what is your view on it? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the marketplaces uh, provides a, a more affordable and at the same time a convenient access for brands to sell in other territories. And uh, so if you look at it, you know, the, the marketplaces has already uh, established their, uh, their footprint in uh, those territories that they are focused and they already have the customer base and they already have set up, you know, some some distribution channels. So definitely, uh, it's, it's just natural that it makes it easier for the brands to collaborate, to work with these marketplaces, to enter in in those territories. But of course, uh, as you said earlier, um, each marketplace has has their own strength in different market. So uh, we cannot say that. Uh, for instance, one marketplace is good for all the markets. It also depends on, you know, the, uh, the distribution network, the, the cultural differences, the compliance regulation, and etc. That brings us to an interesting point, right? So uh, from our experience, as we see, the, the possibly you can group them into three different uh, categories of marketplaces. One are the global marketplaces. These are your Amazon, eBay, Alibaba, etc. Then you have uh, uh, marketplaces which are essentially uh, the uh, geographically popular marketplaces. So in Southeast Asia, these would be marketplaces like uh, Lazada, marketplaces like Zalora, market, uh, uh, or a Bleedly in Indonesia, or a Vila Shopping in Thailand. So these are all regional marketplaces. Then you have category specialists. So if you're going for fashion, you would want to be on Zalora. Uh, if you want to do, uh, in India, if you're looking at fashion, you possibly would be uh, selling on Nike. So each of these uh, uh, present an interesting opportunity. Uh, and a strategy for a brand would be to possibly identify strategic marketplaces in each of those sectors, depending on what products they're selling. Look at global marketplaces as a, uh, one of the steps and that's an easy step. If you're looking at selling into Europe or US, uh, Amazon, eBay would be a logical one. If you're looking at China, uh, 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 Alibaba, of course, not just China, but Alibaba is everywhere that uh, you would obviously look at Alibaba. And if you're looking at regionally Southeast Asia, Lazada becomes an interesting uh, uh, option for you to sell. So from, uh, when I look at some of our, our customers, we see customers like Shumart, for example, they're experimenting by selling heavily and by selling on Lazada. And using that experience, they have then looked at ways to set up their e-commerce strategy. So uh, uh, in terms of uh, understanding the nuances, looking at the operational issues, figuring out how to get this right, and also sell on their own product. So which essentially means that we're looking at marketplace as a channel. It's not like, should I sell online on my website versus marketplace? It's another channel. It's like mobile. It's like selling on uh, your website. Here is another channel for you to sell. So that's how we see it. Uh, I mean, if you look at the global marketplaces, I feel in Europe, which are the locations where uh, Amazon and eBay would be popular, and what are some of the marketplaces you would uh, think of in Europe? Would you like to touch upon a bit of that? Sure, but before I go on to that, I just want to come back to the marketplace uh, question that you had and what Mike was saying about the footprint. 
So something uh, that is... Little, sorry. sorry, can you hear me? Okay, go for it. Right, so marketplaces, why are they important? Um, today, for a small or medium-sized company, it's important to get a sale. And like Mike said, the marketplaces have a footprint. What exactly is a footprint? In most countries today, consumers are going to marketplaces looking for product. That means the marketplaces today have the traffic and the volume of consumers that are there looking for product. What this comes down to is most SMEs today would not have the resources to go online, do a search engine optimization or, or a social media campaign to get the products known out there. Marketplaces would give SMEs a very fast track entry onto online sales and when they start looking at cross border, uh, it also allows them to place their products and position these products in new markets where the volume of business is and where the traffic is. So I would say 60% plus volume sits with marketplaces. And that is why marketplaces are very, very important in this whole discussion. Now, when we come to Europe, besides the Amazon and eBay, we have many other local marketplaces which become very relevant and which many people may not have heard of. If I look at Poland, for example, Eligro.pl is, is massive. You could go into, uh, into Germany and you would see the Otto Group, right? The Otto.de or go into France, see discount. So these are very, very strong local marketplaces where the volume and the consumers are looking for product. So yes, uh, like you were saying, uh, there would be global marketplaces, geographical regions, and then of course, country-wise. So certain marketplaces would be famous in a single country or category. And the same applies to Europe. I mean, <laughs> There are over 335 marketplaces you could mention just in Europe. So you can imagine how how crowded the marketplaces are becoming. So it's, the next step would be identifying the right marketplaces as well, where uh, SME goes out to, to venture into the cross-border space. Okay, no, I, I agree. And the uh, first point which you made, that you're saying that go where the customers are already shopping. So build your brand. By you by picking back on some of the social media promotion strategies that the marketplaces are using, obviously that's a no-brainer, right? So it helps you to get known. It also helps you to uh, be there where people are already shopping, right? So geographical, um, uh, geographically, the local marketplaces obviously become very critical for you once you identify that you want to sell in a particular country, and uh, global marketplaces obviously give you the leverage. And uh, then you can, then of course, like I said, you don't have to treat this as a your own website versus marketplaces kind of strategy. You basically are treating them as an additional channel. Now, how does one make sure that uh, you get the right attention from the marketplaces? Because the marketplaces are obviously catering to multiple brands. So how do you, then do you work with every one of them or do you pick and choose some of them? Each country, do you go one, one by one? Mike, any thoughts on that? Or Atul? Mike, would you like to go first? No, no, please go ahead. Okay, so um, again, the, the, the famous marketplaces, of course, there's lots of information data uh, around it, but there are very, very uh, specialized ones. Like you mentioned in India, if you're looking for, for apparels, of course, it's famous to go on Main Trail, Unique, etc. Similarly, um, if you're in the U.S., it's Etsy for very small hand crafts art type of products. Um, it, it's, it, marketplaces will also, in my opinion, come down to uh, trial and error when you're trying other ones besides the major marketplaces of the world. Um, there's lots of data around different marketplaces, the volumes they carry, the kind of consumers that are there. So that kind of research would help in in identifying which marketplace would be suitable. Having said that, it is not necessarily true that once you place your products on those marketplaces, even though the data and the research says these could be good, that it will be successful. So it also comes down to trial and error. 
using multiple marketplaces, not just single marketplaces, and seeing which one attracts the consumers that want your product. I think uh, just just to give a bit of background. Milk, if you don't mind. Also, does IDC actually help brands to look at which marketplaces to go with? What would be a strategic direction for them? You can touch upon that as well. Sure. Well, I mean, from uh, our perspective, uh, as far as the marketplace is concerned, uh, we look at marketplaces more as a carrier because uh, if you look at the business uh, that you know they have, uh, they facilitate transaction and uh, they don't own any inventory and the main business of most of these marketplaces are, are uh, except you know some of those uh, international players like Amazon that they, they invest in their own distribution channels, distribution uh, 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 framework, but uh, typically most of the marketplaces they only uh, present other people's inventory uh, to, to customers and facilitate you know the transaction. So Obviously, they provide a kind of a convenience to the customer, and at the same time, convenience for uh, retailers, for the brands, for those entrepreneurs who want to sell in other other markets or other territories. But it it also it's uh, not a, basically a, a simple formula today for a, for a newcomer to wants to sell uh, cross border to choose the the right marketplace. It has its own challenges, and uh, as Atul mentioned correctly, uh, if you look at it, uh, it also goes by the product that you are selling, as well as you know the country that you want to sell to, and uh, that country grouping is is very important uh, because, as I said earlier, sometimes you may pick the uh, very strong marketplace, but that marketplace may not have the strong presence in the country or territory that you want to sell to. So, but of course, uh, you, you also need to look at the consumer side. Uh, what is the consumer, you know, preferences, you know, what marketplaces they, they regularly visit. So there is a bit of research that needs to be done in terms of, uh, uh, you know, what marketplace would be relevant to the product that is going to be offered. And, uh, and since you know the products are now these days being offered from uh, many sellers, many channels, uh, so it would be you know uh, uh, quite a challenge for uh, entrepreneurs to actually to find uh, what would be the right platform for them to actually to to sell. So uh, I would say that again, uh, uh, when Kat mentioned about the grouping from international level regional level and you know the the products i also would, uh, rather to actually to put another three types of the marketplace which is again from uh, vertical horizontal as well as you know the hybrid so uh, the hybrid uh, marketplaces are you know companies like amazon which uh, they they sell both uh, you know the other people product as well as their own products into the market Sure, and but but uh, yeah, and when we look at uh, the if if I'm a small brand versus a large brand, okay, small brands, uh, if I have to be nimble and if I have to start off by looking at okay, let me try something out with one marketplace or two marketplaces. You, would you possibly start off with the bigger uh, marketplaces, or would you target the regional marketplaces? What are your first ideas there? Or am I simplifying the question too much? <laughs> no, I'm, well, I mean, if you look at it, as I said, I mean, you need to you need to have a bit of understanding about the, the market that you want to sell to. So I would say, if you want to sell, uh, you know, your products through as many as channels as possible, and you do not have any any kind of a preferences, so of course uh, you can you can go with some large marketplaces, you can go with those smaller, and uh, you can have multi choices. But if you are actually selling products that is specifically uh, targeted to some countries or territories, then you need to be mindful. Uh, there is no, as I said, uh, there is no straightforward uh, kind of a formula. But uh, the, I mean, companies like uh, you know the Winkulum uh, could could be a good uh, 
advisor in that sense. I mean, when I say advisor, uh, because uh, uh, you have already established that, that relationship with, uh, with the different marketplaces, uh, with different uh, stakeholders within this, uh, you know, ecosystem. So it, it would make, you know, easier for uh, brands, for retailers to, to know, okay, so what marketplace they need to choose and how they need to go about it. So that could be, you know, one of the, one of the key areas that uh, retailers or brands need to consider, uh, how to work with some technology companies that they already have that, you know, knowledge, experience, and uh, the, the integration uh, with those marketplaces. Thank you, Mike. So now, uh, for, from our experience, clearly uh, uh, some marketplaces, it's a no-brainer to collaborate with, and the geographically big ones uh, do give a fantastic uh, opportunity for you to uh, collaborate with. Then the category specialists become a very logical choice. Now, when we pick a cherry pick and choose the marketplaces to work with, and then you do the managing portion of the marketplace either internally or through a specialist organization, uh, you do build a good relationship with the marketplaces and they give you a good attention. So, uh, uh, I saw in Southeast Asia uh, very clearly someone like Lazada who would uh, work very closely with both small and big brands to be able to give that attention. And uh, I'm not saying only Lazada, but that, that uh, is a clear uh, option on the table. And each geography, right, like Thailand, uh, the, the are players like We Love Shopping, or uh, in Indonesia, Matahari Mall, or uh, Blue Blue. And uh, you would pick the regional marketplaces as well. Uh, and clearly, first step, right? You would, you would find out how to do this, uh, and more times than uh, now, now uh, the results have been quite satisfactory for the clients that we have been working with. Um, uh, let, let's uh, jump into the uh, aspects which we need to decide once we say that, okay, we want to target, let's say uh, we are picking Southeast Asia as a market to sell into, uh, or uh, maybe we can take both use cases. One is Southeast Asian brands selling into uh, markets between themselves. Or markets into, or they want to target Europe, let's say. Okay, so uh, let's take those two use cases and then uh, look at the challenges that they may face, right? So let's look at the legal and regulatory uh, requirements. I'm possibly going a bit deep here, but uh, uh, Atul, uh, I, I will go, um, um, ask you a few questions in terms of uh, what are the steps that people need to take. Okay, so I've grouped them into uh, four different aspects. Let's look at the legal and regulatory requirements first. So, do all marketplaces, in your opinion, look for company registration in the destination country? Uh, do you work with a third-party logistics company uh, for cross-border shipping, or would you do drop shipping from uh, your, your uh, source country itself? Let's start with those two questions. Okay, so let me let me just come to the the question of do we need a company registration? So, um, if I went back five years ago and you were a seller from a non-EU country, trying to enter the EU, going through Amazon or eBay as the leaders, um, a local company registration was not required. However, over the years, as as e-commerce and cross-border has has exploded. What's, what's been happening is there's been a lot of uh, resistance from local sellers who are paying taxes, etc. Um, fiscal representation in Europe came in. What this means is the, the, the tax authorities are now asking marketplaces to account for sales that are happening, which were actually not coming in the, in the limelight of taxes. So VAT, for example, across Europe became very important, and currently it's one of the hottest topics going on from a cross-border selling perspective into Europe. That comes up now. You would need an importer of record or something called an EOE number when you import goods. A third-party logistics operator cannot be the owner of the goods. So you have to clearly identify who's responsible for these inputs. 
those imports would be subject to additional VAT, which was not being paid previously, and they would have to comply with the local laws of 28 countries when they cross the sales of and the thresholds in these markets. So there's a lot of regulation coming in now as we speak. I mean, five years back, none of this existed. Currently, lots and lots of new regulations. Uh, and this is just to make the playing field level from a European perspective that's coming in. Um, Mike, what's your view on that? So how do we make it easy? I mean, I have a question there. When, if it's if it so complicated, then how do we make it easy for companies to come in? Right. So if, if, if there's a regulation, that means there's a straightforward way of doing business if you want to come to Europe. If you have to register a company, that's easy. So One World as a company would, would assist cross-border sellers the guidance or will hold their hand on getting a company registration or an import of record uh, registration in place. This makes them compliant within, within uh, from a European perspective in terms of importation of goods. And if they have a VAT number, eventually in the future they'll need a bank account because marketplaces are also leading towards where they need to pay into a local bank account. Uh, again, this is to account for the differential VAT, etc. We can assist in all steps. So the idea here is how do we make it easy for a cross-border seller to enter different marketplaces? And, and companies like Winculum or One World are there. Winculum would support with the marketplace listings. One World can help with strategies, whether it's straight from market or stock positioning within the market. So again, we would hold the seller's hand through the process as they evolve from a startup in cross-border to becoming a mature cross-border seller. Yes, so that's, that's actually, yeah, sorry, Mike. Uh, cool. Yeah, I wanted to add this that, you know, uh, this is actually is a very good, interesting topic. How the, uh, the companies like uh, Winkolov and Walmart are able to actually to make the whole process easier for uh, for companies, for retailers. So my question to you guys is that what was the key driver for uh, Winkloom and Von Vold to to have this strategic partnership, and uh, how this partnership will uh, benefit the you know the, the the consumer as well as you know the retailers, the companies who wants to sell to those consumers. So you now, thanks, Mike. Uh, see, you now. I'll uh, I'll go first uh, to. So in terms, in terms of uh, uh, what we are doing, right, Atul is uh, uh, means at the heart of the company, it's a shipping company, right? So they are very strong in shipping. They have uh, uh, unit economics, which are very cheap in terms of uh, uh, being able to ship goods into various countries. And we come in from a technology background where we are making the process of selling into marketplaces easier. So we are integrating into uh, multiple marketplaces globally, Mike. So we are integrated today to uh, uh, more than 30 plus marketplaces. And uh, that's a number which is going up uh, every, every week by week because we have a dedicated team which is automating the integration to marketplaces. And uh, there are a few other challenges which I'll allude to. Uh, in terms of uh, listing and reconciliation, so we are automating the listing process as well. So what that does is, uh, we are, from a technology perspective, we are making it easy for sellers and brands to sell on marketplaces. And Atul comes in with the know-how, uh, Manuel comes in from the know-how of uh, being able to take care of customs, how to register the company, uh, making them uh, sell on marketplaces, and. Uh, more importantly, making sure inexpensively they're able to ship to the end customer. Manzato, do you want to add to what I said? Yeah, um, Mike, to, to further elaborate on what Venkat is saying here, um, what we see this as, it's, it's, a, it's a collaboration of two tech platforms. So Winculum is a tech platform which focuses around the marketplaces. How can we open up listings? We've already identified that marketplaces is definitely a good place to go. However, one of the key drivers of cross-border is also the cost of getting the goods across to, to various parts of the world, understanding customs, understanding compliance in different markets. So One World 
focused, as Renkit said, on, on delivery solutions. So, so we are like your hotels.com or bookings.com when it comes to e-commerce distribution solutions globally. So we, would, if it's postal untracked, whether it is a registered post, whether it would be direct access into different regions of the world, accessing ultra-local courier companies who are very specialized in a country, or the major integrators of the world like the DHL, UPS, and FedEx, we have integrated all these onto a single tech platform. Now, when you bring two tech platforms together, where somebody can list on the marketplaces, there's a tech platform which gives you all the solutions for delivery. That means a seller today can decide based on SKUs, basket value, geographical regions, expectations of the consumer in deciding how they would like to take it to that market through a single place, which is the Winkler One World Partnership. We're integrated in, in, in one piece as a one piece software. They would seamlessly be able to go to different markets by simply handing it over in their local markets or when they evolve position stocks in different markets. So I think um, by bringing two technology platforms together and the know-how on how to do cross-border. So One World has been in the cross-border space since 2008. So, you know, nine years makes us a dinosaur because this is a very new area and we would like to bring our knowledge and share that with sellers so that through this partnership we can take sellers out to different parts of the world and hopefully make the, the whole process and journey uh, quite friendly and, and seamless. What we've done, Mike, is to completely integrate the platforms. So any customers of uh, OneWorld have access to the marketplace integrations that we have. And likewise, the cross-border shipping, uh, which uh, the platform of OneWorld is integrated to us so that any of our customers can leverage them for cross-border as well. So that's the way we are looking at it. I think uh, this will make the process of cross-border easy. And what we're also doing is uh, we 50 plus logistics partners integration as well, where uh, one world is not present, they can actually add them into the logistics network so that they can complete the uh, pickup and delivery into the target location. So, which essentially means every country we have a local partner as well. So, it's a complete platform where we are talking as a full blown logistics network and a full blown marketplace network. Uh, I'll, I'll go further and uh, Achil, let's get back to these questions. I know I'm cognizant of time, but uh, there are a lot of interesting questions here. So the first step, of course, is which products to sell, right? So we look at uh, what is the cost of uh, the goods and look at what is the shipping cost, uh, add the duties and see whether that is still uh, at a price point which is uh, where customers will buy. Now, once we have done that groundwork, uh, there is clearly many products which will fall into the bucket of these are products which can be sold into the target market. And uh, uh, the next step comes into the identification of the marketplaces to collaborate with, which we spoke about. Uh, then we get into this question of while we still don't know, we're entering into a new market. Let's say uh, we're getting, uh, someone is entering Thailand, let's say, and uh, we decided to work with We Love Shopping or Lazada. And uh, we, we want to decide what is the best way to do it. And let's say the products are based in India or the products are based, um, let's just take a simple case of the products being based in India. Well, what would be the first step? Would you actually keep the goods in the target uh, location with a logistics partner? Or would you uh, uh, identify the best cues that you would want to sell and adopt a dropship model where you get the orders first and you will ship it from India itself? Atul, do you want to answer that? Um, well, if I go back to how we, we helped uh, sellers in China going back to 2008 and 2009, the journey has been long. And initially, when the whole process started, we, we were not sure what would happen. Uh, Cross-border at that time was virtually non-existent, right? So the first strategies that came up was how do you list and ship from your home market because when you start moving inventory without knowing whether that inventory is going to be accepted in a particular country, it can become an expensive exercise. So the easiest way to start trialing a marketplace or a cross-border is list from home and find the 
most cost effective way in getting it there. So like you pointed out, what is the cost of the product? What is the cost of logistics? What is the duties and taxes? What is the marketplace fees and what would the remittance cost you? Because if you are ha receiving local currency and there's a conversion, once you've done that, you've come up with a pricing strategy for that particular market, initially taking into account the cost of getting the goods across cross-border. And once you have established that, uh, the next step would be, of course, to identify, uh, based on your experience there, some hot SKUs which you may want to position. The one key reason why you position stock closer to the consumer is speed of delivery. Consumers today want faster delivery, more visible delivery. They want to know where their items are. Uh, today, from China, if we are buying, uh, most of the marketplaces are offering free shipping. Fantastic. But we have zero visibility and it's going to take 30 days. The consumers are demanding more today. And, and the model that we are talking about is how do we bring visibility and choice to the consumers and let them decide how they wish to buy from the buyers. And I think that would change the way cross border is seen and how it will evolve. Yeah, I mean, at the same time, I think uh, apart from uh, the, the challenges that has already been uh, shared, uh, I think prices still, you know, play a very important factor to convince, you know, the international consumers. Uh, so that is actually is one of the key motivators for for customers to actually to buy from, you know, the other marketplaces. But at the same time, uh, just to emphasize on what uh, Atul we have shared having a long-term competitive advantage in terms of, you know, the, the website appeal, the, the, the payment options, the convenient for the consumer service in terms of return or delivery uh, would be, you know, something that is quite uh, uh, challenging. And, and this is our, the, these are the real challenges that uh, some of the brands, some of the retailers are facing in, in today's environment. And, uh, uh, if, if companies are able to actually, or technology companies are able to address uh, these issues, I think they would uh, definitely stand out in the market and at the same time helping the retail brands to, to have a more, uh, smooth, convenient journey to the cross-border business. So when you're working with marketplaces, Mike, so they're one of the advantages if you're working in close partnership with the marketplace, then you are uh, able to take care of uh, keeping the goods, making sure deliveries are happening, providing track and trace, and even if someone were to return, there is a clear path and clear visibility of what is to be done. I think that's also an advantage while you're learning the nuances in the market. So I think uh, it reduces the risk of failure very clearly. So I think uh, so that brings us back to where the marketplace is definitely being a channel to work with. Right? So, um, this, uh, do you want to add something there, Mike? Sorry. No, no. I, I was I was just confirming that it's true. Uh, I mean, yeah. Amazon is a very good example. They started from early '90s to 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 look, enter into other markets in other territories, and uh, today, actually, 40 percent of their sales is coming from outside the U.S. And uh, if you look at Alibaba, on the other hand, uh, the sales outside China is, is less than 10%. So there is a huge potential still out there for uh, companies to sell you know, cross-border. Mm, that's interesting. I, mean, I didn't realize the, that data point. But 90% uh, 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 within China is that Alibaba. Okay, that's interesting. Yes, absolutely. So 90% of the business for Alibaba is still coming for, from China. And given the fact that the China itself is a huge market with a, with a large population and uh, uh, well-connected, good infrastructure, and affordable, you know, the logistic, obviously it's more appealing for Alibaba to, to still be focused on the, on the China market to conquer that market before uh, deciding to enter into other territories. But they are doing it in a different way by acquiring, you know, some some other uh, marketplaces, so that they are still, you know, uh, working on, you know, creating some footprints in other territories. Okay, cool. So uh, I think the business models we have touched upon 
uh, most of the points here. So I think your recommendation is do dropship, figure out the nuances, work out a close partnership with the marketplace, and uh, through the partnership, the rest of the things like customs and handling returns, etc., providing tracking traces available. Correct. Uh, I think we uh, we'll let's touch briefly on the technology. Uh, the the listing piece is interesting and important because each marketplace has its own requirement in terms of how the images should look, how the attribute should look. So then what we have done is to automate the process of uh, if you have an image, you can transform it the way the marketplace understands uh, so that you have one picture and you have defined the attributes. Uh, the data gets transformed in the way the marketplace needs to understand. Of course, it's a... Uh, we have done it for some marketplaces and we are automating the process for uh, many of them as we speak. Uh, there are a lot of interesting challenges there. Many marketplaces don't have APIs, so you still need to uh, take their approval and crawl and integrate to them, and or you build the APIs for them. So that uh, this is a process which we are doing as a dedicated uh, team is working on in the getting the integrations done and automating the listing process to each of these marketplaces. So which makes it easier for, for companies. Sellers and brands don't need to wait uh, in terms of recreating images, recreating attributes. You basically do it once and you're able to push it to multiple channels. Our own vision is that you have, you do it once, you should be able to go to 65 countries without absolutely any uh, manual intervention. Uh, we go further to the various fulfillment solutions. I think we spoke about it. We, uh, you can keep the products initially on a dropship mode, but there are logistics partners in every country practically, um, both who use our software or our logistics partners. We could collaborate with OneWell and the local partner to facilitate that as we go. Uh, if you uh, see increased business, you could then consider registering your company locally itself and keeping your items. But I would say uh, that's very down the road. Step one, do dropship. Step two, work with a local logistics partner and grow. Uh, I think really once you reach a, a significant volume is when you would consider setting up your own warehouse and things like that. Uh, we go further. Payment reconciliations is an interesting aspect. Uh, it's, a, it's a problem in some countries uh, where returns, e-commerce in general returns are higher. Uh, India is, is in the 20s. Um, the so rest of the market, maybe it's near to 10, 8 to 10 percent. So uh, you're, you're basically looking at uh, reconciliations as a piece which is important as well. So technology-wise, we are uh, automating the process for getting reconciliations. I won't go into too much detail today, but uh, that's an interesting space. Mike, I'll ask this question. How do you ensure experience across the sales channels? Means, well, so if you're a high-end brand, would you still go to marketplaces? Is there a risk that your brand loses some of its uh, brand values, or you think uh, it should be managed? Uh, what do you? What is your view on that? Well, none at all. I mean, uh, to the 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 brand, the retail brand, will not lose its value just because they are selling through marketplaces. Uh, a marketplace is pretty much you can look at it from you know a physical perspective, like a department store. And we see that retail brands, they both sell through department store as well as their own uh, retail outlets. So a marketplace is an opportunity for retail brands to reach out to a larger number of uh, the target customers and the people that they, they are following the brands but they want to actually to, uh, to get their hands on, on those merchandise at a much uh, more affordable prices. So, uh, again, marketplace, it's, uh, to some extent, is uh, copying the, the same way that you know, the, the department stores are selling those brands' products, which uh, usually you get the pr products at the, at the lower price. But of course, the product may not be the, the latest you know, the, the design or may not be you know, uh, the, 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 the latest season. But for some consumers, that doesn't really make any, any difference, and, and they still look at you know the brand as something that is uh, you know in terms of the quality, in terms of the design that they want to have it, they want to buy the the, the products. 
Okay, and uh, the, the relationship with marketplaces, again, I think I touched upon it. There are uh, specialist partners who can work with you, uh, 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 or you could uh, set up your own team to uh, work with the marketplaces. So they, these are some of the things, decisions to make. Again, I would say start with uh, a partner, and then uh, if the volume is growing significantly, you can consider other uh, models there. So as we go here, I, mean, so I know we're running short on time, Atul, just spend two, three minutes uh, in terms of what it took to educate the market and how did you facilitate uh, the process in China? You might touch upon it a little bit. Absolutely. So the, like, like I mentioned earlier, the journey started as back as 2008, 2009. We worked with the largest uh, e-commerce company today in China. At that time, we were their partners in Europe. The, the, the vision behind China was how do we get Chinese sellers to come across the border? And it was down to uh, lots and lots of conferences, education, showing the, the, the sellers that potentially by going cross border you may get better value. So if they were getting one RMB, they might get 1.8 or 2 RMB by going cross border. Was there benefit in the mathematics, even though you were paying storage? even though you were paying for a pick and pack service, was there still better returns for the seller? And the answer was yes. So we started sharing a lot of data, uh, educating the sellers on the benefits of going cross-border, starting from China and then eventually setting up warehouses. Now, if I, if I very quickly give you a small example, initially with our, our original partners in China, the first requirement we had for a 3PL was 15 square meters. This was in 2008. 150 square meters was what we projected, what we needed for cross-border stock holding from a 3PL perspective. Now, literally seven, eight years on, today between just these two companies, and I'm not counting other Chinese companies that are present in the UK, just between One World and our original partner, there is over 500,000 square foot of 3PL space for cross-border commerce sellers. And if I was to tie up all the Chinese companies that are holding warehouses from a 3PL perspective, I would easily estimate that to cross 1.5 million square foot. So what I'm trying to show you is the growth continues. It's not stopping. China led the way. Southeast Asia can follow and will follow. And we're here to assist sellers from Southeast Asia from the very beginning whilst they mature and start selling comfortably themselves into this region. So what you're saying, Natul, is if you can somehow find a way to do a million dollar now, in eight years you can do 100,000 million. Exactly. <laughs> That's the multiple that you spoke about in terms of a space which, which has grown with that one partner of yours. Uh, but, uh, but that's the kind of opportunity we're talking. It may not be exactly that, that much, but yeah, I mean, that's, uh, it's a fascinating journey. I think we will conduct a number of roadshows into Southeast Asia to educate uh, sellers and brands in each of the countries. So you can uh, uh, hopefully join us into some of those sessions, but we'll take each step of the process and we will be working to show how it works, and uh, that will make it easier. Uh, Absolutely. So, you touch about Europe. Uh, you obviously can handle all the 28 countries uh, in Europe, correct? That is correct. So we would be your one-stop shop uh, if you are looking to do business in 28 countries in Europe. You would, you would, we would be your one-stop shop. So you don't have to start going into all the different markets looking for different partners. If you're looking for simplicity uh, and a company that can help you across the 28 countries, yes, we'd be one of them. Okay, and uh, so I think we uh, will summarize here. Of course, uh, I have mentioned that we have a variety of in, uh, integrations in the marketplace and 3PLs. But so if you summarize the things, you, you list into, the since there is listing, you can easily get into the marketplaces. You can manage all orders in a single place. And uh, with uh, one world, you could, um, you're able to uh, take care of the customs there. And we, uh, so essentially it's a one stop uh, to manage both your sales and fulfillment. So we'll jump into questions. I, I know I uh, uh, went through some of these things quite quickly because we have about 15 minutes for questions, so we can possibly 
start off with the questions that we have. Uh, so there is a question about how, how, how do we go about this? This is from Mr. Yongsung in Singapore. Uh, how do we go about selling into other regions of Southeast Asia? We are in the apparel segment and we want to enter uh, all the different uh, countries in Southeast Asia and the Indian market as well. How can you guys help? Uh, when I think uh, from a Southeast Asia perspective, uh, I don't know where you're based, but uh, let's take any of the countries, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong. Uh, uh, we have uh, integrations into marketplaces in each of these places. And uh, we have uh, uh, local language support as well in these countries. So essentially, what, uh, there are two methods in which you could uh, work. Uh, you could either work uh, uh, with us on a consolidated basis where we can identify the marketplaces in conjunction with you. So when I say consolidated basis, we'll do a one or two day workshops with you to understand the category that you are selling into, what are the possible marketplaces to sell into. And uh, once that is identified, then we basically look at uh, the costs involved in terms of uh, the products and see uh, which is the, what is the target price in each of these uh, countries. And uh, once we uh, uh, come up with the cost economics and confirm that these pro products can be sold into the countries, you pick your, you cherry pick your top products, let's say 10 to 20 types of um, um, stock keeping units, means uh, 20 uh, units, uh, and uh, those 20 units we will then pay, uh, pilot with one, uh, one marketplace in the, in the target country or two marketplaces. Uh, you could, like Atul said, start with a dropship model and uh, then move the products into the target location itself once you're very clear they're selling well. So we can do it on a uh, model in which uh, we can walk you with you the whole process, or we could just give you a tech platform and explain to you what is required and you could do it yourself. Because I don't think it's so difficult if you're in Southeast Asia uh, you, uh, already. So it is really about uh, how it's in the different con uh, countries uh, being able, I mean, it's just uh, pain of understanding how to do it in the first few weeks. Once you are set up, you are really good to go. The second part of the question was in, about India. I would, the answer would be similar. Uh, we are integrated to practically every marketplace in India. And uh, we would work with you to uh, identify what needs to be done. In India and in these countries, we also have uh, uh, marketplace management uh, partners with us. So which essentially means that uh, we could work with you the whole nine yards in terms of how this should be done. So at the end of the presentation, there is a, uh, an email here. You could just send us uh, the details. We will get in touch with you, and uh, we will do a workshop to see what are your needs and work, work, work the next steps with you. Oh, thank you. Actually, you, uh, uh, you want to add something to what I said? Just something, because I think one of the key, key concerns uh, uh, to, to people who are on the webinar would be it's all well and good saying ship from, from, from destination and ship from market. How cheap or expensive is it? I think the cost factor is very important. Mike had touched on cost. So I, I use one example all the time. A seller from China selling a phone case worldwide or into Europe can, can sell, pay the marketplace fees, get it delivered to a consumer for under one euro. So guys, there are solutions out there. Uh, of course, it's a lightweight item, but imagine a seller can deliver a phone case under one euro after paying for everything. So there are loads and loads of solutions when you start with a ship from market strategy, depending on your SKUs and your weights, etc. Uh, I don't think people should get concerned that it'll be too expensive. How will we manage it? And uh, let's go to the next question. I, uh, I hope that's comprehensive, but uh, please do write to us. We will. Uh, I will be happy to work with you to work out the nuances here. Uh, there is a question from Mr. Ahmad Zawai. Uh, can you tell us how to go about cross-border and e-commerce in general in the Middle East region? So if we look at Middle East, within Middle East, uh, uh, when we, we are uh, working with uh, 
and both the retailers and the marketplaces in uh, Middle East. And uh, when you look, when you look at uh, uh, the marketplaces, we are integrated into marketplaces like Noon, uh, Noon.com, Soup.com. Uh, in, uh, we have uh, integrated into uh, uh, a few other marketplaces, and just uh, uh, I think Wabi.com is the other one which comes to mind. And uh, we are integrated to uh, uh, multiple marketplaces in the African and uh, South African region as well. So what that really means is uh, you could uh, easily uh, identify which marketplaces you want to sell into. Um, and uh, uh, we, we will facilitate the process in terms of uh, uh, similarly working with you to see what uh, uh, products you are selling and uh, which marketplace are suited for, for your products. And uh, it's literally uh, working that out and you should be good to go in two to three weeks time really. So it doesn't take a lot of time. Um, and then of course if you're uh, having enterprise systems of your own, Let's say you, you have an ERP like an SAP or an Oracle or a NetSuite, then we'll have to integrate to them. Uh, but uh, the process is not too long. I mean, the two, three weeks becomes more like six, eight weeks uh, for, for doing that. Uh, just because it's a custom software. I mean, uh, of course, SAP is a product, but you have customized it for your systems, uh, for your uh, um, uh, enterprise system, so which means we have to, uh, there is a bit of work to integrate into the uh, ERP. Uh, but otherwise, process-wise, it's straightforward, and One World uh, has established presence in the Middle East as well, and we have other logistics partners that they have and we have. Uh, so in conjunction, we can comfortably take care of within Middle East and uh, within uh, Africa and South Africa as well. Now, if I step further, if you are thinking of how do I go from Middle East into other geographies? It's the same answer, really. We need to just work out the strategy with you, look at the cost economics, and see what makes sense in terms of the target markets and the uh, marketplaces to collaborate with, uh, and basically work out the next steps. So it is uh, very clear. Uh, we, we will have a simple seven bulleted uh, plan for you, and we will go step by step to work with it. Of course, it doesn't mean that everything is simple and easy. We will hit bottlenecks, but it's really, if you are willing to take the initial week's pain, a few weeks of pain, I think uh, you will have an extra channel which will well be uh, worth it in terms of creating revenue for you. I think, uh, Vaika, just to add something, I think the most common question uh, from you know the audience of this session is that how they should go about you know uh, and start selling in a marketplace. And um, I mean, I just want to summarize, you know, what we have explained and what we have, what we have shared with with, uh, with our audience is that you need to go through a five steps. The, I mean, of course, the step number one is to have a strategic clarity. You need to identify which market, which opportunity you want to focus. You, I mean, that would be the number one steps. And followed by, you know, having the right assortment of the product. Understand what is the local taste. What are the rules? What are the regulation? What are the compliances that you need to actually you need to follow? And the third is to have that global, local, uh, you know, the the presence from the from the online marketplaces. So, and working with a company like Vinculum, of course, would provide them with the you know that kind of the workshop uh, tools so that they are able to to localize their offering in each market. And followed by you know the warehousing and fulfillment, uh, which is one of the key areas that they need to look at you know uh, uh, carefully, and being able to actually to deliver choices to the to the consumers. So these are the steps that you know every company, every retail brands, every entrepreneurs that wants to go online, wants to sell cross border, need to take into consideration, and the, having the right partner, having the right technology partner who has the knowledge, who has the experience, who has the presence in, in, in different market would definitely make their life easier and make this journey even smoother for them. So thanks, Mike. And uh, I'll continue with the questions. There are a few more. Uh, so 
there is uh, there's a question from uh, Vikram Dutta, Mr. Vikram Dutta of India. Uh, he is asking, can you give us examples of how Indian companies are selling in Southeast Asia and Europe? How are they doing it? Now, uh, I think they want to answer some of that in terms of how are they selling in Europe, but I can give you some names anyway before that. See, there are a variety of companies who are selling. Let's take some of our customers. There is a uh, uh, Jaipur, for example. Jaipur has a uh, website which uh, uh, I mean they are essentially a maker of ethnic wear from, J uh, from as the name says Jaipur. So ethnic Indian wear. So they targeted Indian consumers overseas and so the, some of the big markets for them is uh, UK and US. So they essentially uh, first adopted their own website model in terms of selling into this uh, uh, these geographies. In fact Jaipur uh, went absolutely by themselves. Uh, they they tried selling into uh, UK, tried selling into US, and they um, and of course they use our platform, uh, but they started uh, doing it on their own. Then, as a second step, they started selling on marketplaces. Now, if I take other, um, and that's just one example, right? But there are a variety of companies who are piloting now. I mean, these are guys in lingerie, guys uh, made to order uh, clothes. Uh, there is a company called eShakti which is selling into US and they've used Amazon as the first channel. Uh, uh, they've gone into Europe, they've gone into US and we are working with, uh, we're potentially going to work with them to uh, get them into multiple countries in Southeast Asia. Now there it's on a uh, outsourced model where we are actually going to work to handle the marketplace management as well. But uh, British, uh, uh, the other cases which I spoke is more in terms of uh, helping them uh, with the strategy, helping them register. This goes into even some marketplaces, I mean, without naming, there are some, uh, there are fashion marketplaces uh, in India which are very well known, uh, who are looking seriously to go into Middle East, uh, looking at target markets in Southeast Asia. So, uh, they, uh, I mean, people are definitely uh, doing this very seriously. I would say in the next six to nine months, the floodgates will open uh, in terms of uh, various brands and various companies trying to step into these markets. So, but uh, typically, it seems to be that they're targeting uh, Amazon as first step and the regional marketplaces like Lazada as the next step. So, that's typically how people are going. Uh, for, from if I were to just try to crystallize that into a simple statement, but uh, doesn't mean uh, that's the only way. Um, the, definitely, those people will go into the other marketplaces which we are talking about as well. Um, there is a, another question there uh, uh, from Salish Chakaria: who, How easy or difficult? I'm just uh, picking what I'm getting. There may be many questions I miss. I'm sorry for that. Uh, but Salesh is asking us uh, how easy or difficult it is to manage the orders from my own web shop. And if I sell on Lazada, for example, will it not be difficult to manage returns? How do you suggest this can be handled? Atul, do you want to talk about how do you manage uh, returns from a cross-border perspective? Okay, so um, very quick data. Cross-border returns is very minimal. We are seeing under 2% on a cross-border uh, returns purely because of uh, the return cost sometimes can be expensive. You may have local domestic receiving uh, returns handling centers. However, in many parts of the world, you have to pay duties and taxes. Now, to reclaim duties and taxes becomes a big problem. So what traditionally happens is a lot of the returns, if somebody's bought something wrong or the wrong size, they tend to resell it on local marketplaces or simply hand it over to a friend or relative. Uh, when I say under 2%, but from a domestic perspective, Germany itself in apparels sees over 40% returns. That's a different world altogether. But cross-border, under 2%, domestic receiving centers are available across Europe. Local addresses where a return can be returned by a consumer, that's all in place, can be brought into a consolidating center for further instructions. So sure. it's all available across Europe. So if we look at Southeast Asia and Lazada as the question asked, I, mean, I would say it's not very different from uh, what happens in domestically. Let's say you're working on Flipkart and a product gets returned. Uh, the challenge is similar. So the, uh, even though cross-border sales and uh, the return percentages are much lower uh, 
uh, in markets like Singapore. Uh, uh, but what would, well, well, when you have a logistics partner in this place, essentially the goods do come back and you could uh, resell them. So then if you're keeping the goods uh, uh, where there is a partner locally, I think it is a lesser of a problem. Uh, but the initial step when you're piloting, let's say you do the deliveries and there are returns, where they could be, uh, then you have to configure a small percentage of losses into the business plan. But uh, uh, as we go past the pilot, you would have a local logistics partner. I think you, it would be just like doing business in uh, India as well. When you get the goods back into the local logistics partner, right? So it, there is no different. So you would have that as a part of your plan, and there's no reason why you can't uh, meaningfully uh, create a profitable business out of it. So I'll, I'll jump on to the, uh, for some more questions. Mike, you may have to step in here. So we are talking of, uh, we are running a, this is from Mr. V. Ling Lea. I don't know whether I pronounced it right. I'm sorry if I have not. Uh, we are running a marketplace in Cambodia and we see potential of getting international sellers to sell into this country. How do you see the Southeast Asian market, especially Cambodia and Vietnam, in terms of growth? I'll, I'll check on Mike, but do you have any view? Cambodia and yes, Vietnam? Uh, well, I mean, uh, obviously Cambodia and Vietnam and, uh, are, are emerging markets in, in Southeast Asia. There are uh, potentials from the, from the retail perspective. And uh, we see that the market, due to you know the several factors such as you know the, the young population, and uh, better uh, and an improvement in, in, in infrastructure, and of course the the uh, cheaper labor force, it makes it a very attractive place for uh, brands or retailers to actually to sell in those markets. But having said that. Uh, there are, you know, still some challenges. So you, they need to be aware about, you know, that the banking and payments could be a challenge, especially in, in a country like like Cambodia. But uh, uh, each market has its own characteristic, uh, and each market have, has their own uh, set of challenges, uh, and they need to actually be uh, mindful how they want to. Uh, localize their offerings for each market and how they want to uh, be flexible in terms of you know the market uh, and in terms of you know the the product assortment that they want to sell in those markets so uh, I'll uh, second uh, some of what you said Mike in terms of uh, these markets that right, given the opportunity that we have of uh, using our warehousing solution to uh, enable logistics companies and also uh, some of the marketplace management companies we have partners in Vietnam uh, with whom we work closely. What we see is uh, there is a beautiful uh, talent available, and uh, uh, they are uh, able to jump in and uh, uh, help brands come into the market, and they take care of the marketplace management. And uh, uh, I would say there is a definite opportunity in terms of uh, significant growth. In both the markets, Vietnam is definitely on the radar of many brands. Uh, Cambodia, as well, there is an opportunity. Of course, it is uh, we have to see the size and uh, how much uh, people will buy. But I think there is uh, clearly some segments where there is opportunity uh, for brands to go into these markets. I think uh, I've been told that our time is up, and while there are a number of other questions that we would like to answer. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed the session and hearing uh, from uh, both uh, One World and Mike. Thank you for your time. And if there are any questions, write to us, and we will definitely uh, make a list of the questions and send replies back to you. And uh, just uh, send your questions on marketing at winklingroup.com so that we can. Uh, answer you and uh, I mean, if anyone wants to discuss further, please feel free to write to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.